So once again, I am Gloria Campos from WFAA TV. I've been a television broadcast journalist for 38 years, uh, 28 years of those here at WFAA as a reporter and anchor. I've also uh, shot video, shot film when I first started out in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas in 1976. And uh, the Kennedy assassination and the subsequent coverage of that event really changed my life and really got me thinking as a little nine-year-old fourth grader in Harlingen, Texas, that being a news reporter was where you, I wanted to be because they got to go places and do things that regular folks did not. And the event that really <coughs> exemplifies that is Oswald has been shot, which we saw live on television back in 1963 during those four days of trauma. And Fred here has a direct link to that iconic video. And of course, we've got Bob who took that Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. And then we've got Jim Lavelle who was escorting Oswald and uh, Bob Huffsacker. Huffaker. Sorry. Uh, who was also reporting here, and he got kind of thrown into the mix. Uh, really, he was down there with a microphone, but he wasn't going to speak. He was here for CBS, covering for CBS, and then Gary DeLon was working for Cliff Radio, and uh, we're going to see all of them in action and how they carried out their duties that faithful day. It was a Sunday if I recall correctly. And we're going to start, we've got some clips of old film that we're going to show you. And please play uh, close attention because we're not gonna rerun them. Uh, you've seen some of these uh, clips before, but some you have not, and some you have not heard. So we're going to begin right now with what I like to call, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And you're going to find out why. This is CBS affiliate, KRLD TV. Uh, they were a little bit late showing the shooting live, and there's a reason why, which uh, I won't go into because I wasn't there. But that was videotaped and replayed, of course, time and time again, as we're all used to seeing it. Our panelists is uh, KRLD TV and radio reporter Bob Huffecker. And he narrates on camera, but as I said, he wasn't really supposed to because he was there with Nelson Benton, who was actually outside in the van. And so you were the man on the spot with a microphone when, as we all know, Oswald was escorted out, getting ready to be transferred from the city jail to the county jail, escorted by the gentleman here to my right, to my left, Lieutenant uh, Detective Jim Lavelle. And now let's take a look at that clip right now. This is the basement floor of the Dallas City Hall, and that's a scuffle on the basement floor. It seems to concern photographers. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. We're going to. Oswald has been shot. We're going to switch now. Police. Police are pulling. We're going to switch now to Bob Huffhacker down in the basement of the courthouse, who is close to the scene. Go ahead, Bob. Lee Harold Oswald has been shot. The situation, here is the situation is now that Lee Harold Oswell has been shot. The man who saw the shot fired said it was fired by a man wearing a black hat, a brown coat, a man that everyone down here thought was a secret service agent. Situation We're switching now to Bob Huffacker downstairs. Oswell will be moved quickly outside and the only word so far is that the shot came from a man wearing a black hat and a coat. Here comes Oswald. He's, he is ashen and unconscious at this time, now being moved in. He's not moving. He's in the ambulance now. And attendants, police are quickly climbing in. They're now having to remove the armored truck from the head of the basement entrance here and the ambulance and the ambulance is waiting for the 
for, for the uh, tenants to move the armored truck, which... This is the armored... This is the armored truck on the outside of the Dallas Police Department. It's being moved out onto Commerce Street, and now the ambulance is coming out. The ambulance with Lee Harvey Oswald, who was shot just a few minutes ago as he was being transferred to the, uh, from, was planning to be transferred from the city jail to the uh, county courthouse. Now let's go back to Harry Reasoner in New York. And that voice is of De Nelson Benton of CBS, who was outside, and of course Bob was inside. So as a reporter, we, we've talked about this uh, a lot today, is that the, that area was just jam-packed full of reporters. Uh, did they normally cover transfers such as this in that manner? No police department in the world would ever want to uh, have done a public transfer of a man so immediately hated uh, as, a, as a prisoner. And uh, Jim here tried his best to avoid it being public, and so did uh, a number of other officers. Uh, Captain Fritz in particular um, and that is partly the reason for the shifting of uh, the plans at the last minute when it was decided that the armored truck would be used as a decoy instead of the actual vehicle to transfer Oswald. That car was being backed into place uh, to pick Oswald up uh, at the moment the shot was fired. So I was watching the car back toward me, and uh, the sh shot happened. Oswald crumpled, and uh, Jim and uh, <laughs> Lieutenant, I mean, and uh, Detective Graves, uh, assisted by a handful of other officers, uh, dragged both the shooter and the victim as quickly as possible into the jail office. And. Um, no, it was not anything ordinary. And, and Bob mentions this, you fought against them making a public transfer of Oswald. Tell us about that. Earlier that, that morning, uh, Captain Fritz and I talked about it, and we, uh, we didn't like the idea of transferring it in the uh, armored motor vehicle because uh, we had many threats on Oswald's life all during the weekend and uh, that was one reason I handcuffed myself to him because if they did try to take him away from us as they threatened to do all, all of these calls were anonymous if they did try to take him they'd have to take me too and I wasn't going to go willingly <laughs> so that uh, was the reason I handcuffed to him but uh, uh, earlier that morning I uh, when they, I don't know about my good friend down here. He, he, when they, when they changed, when they, somebody decided to get that armored motor vehicle, and transfer him in that. Uh, my friend down here, on next with the red tie, he started, he got it out over the air before I knew about it. So I <laughs> think he had a, somebody spying for him in there. But anyhow, <laughs> the, he knew about the transfer. But uh, what the anonymous people were saying was that they were going to turn that armored motor vehicle over and set it afire. And when I was informed of that, I told the captain, I said, well, I might feel a little heat one time, sometime down the line, but I said, I, I don't want to start it today. <laughs> and uh, I didn't like it, and he didn't like it either. And just to add a little more to that, the... Uh, while uh, the federal officers was talking to Oswald that morning before the transfer, he and I had went over to the White Plaza Hotel and had a cup of coffee and discussed ways we could get out of that, but uh, we couldn't see any way of getting out of it. But when we got back to the city hall and walked up on the first floor to catch the elevator up to the third floor, uh, when the elevator door opened, uh, Chief Curry stepped out. Jesse Curry. Uh, Curry, yeah, yeah, Jess Curry stepped out, and so we backed up to the table. There wasn't nobody there on Sunday morning, but uh, during the week they they bring the prisoners from the jail down and take them to city court. 
we backed up there and discussed that. And again, I voiced my objection to the armored motor and Captain Fritz did too. And I told Chief Curry, I said, Chief, you know that this elevator stops here on the first floor. I said, we could take him out here on the first floor and put him in a car on Main Street and we can be down to the county jail before anybody knows we even left the building. And his exact words to me was, Lavelle, I have given my word that they can film the transfer and I'm gonna keep it because I don't want them to think that uh, we mistreated him or abused him in any way and the best way to prove that is to let them film the transfer. Well, uh, I know where he was coming from on that, but I didn't, uh, I didn't like the idea much. And so, uh, but he didn't, it's just in case, uh, well, he had more power than I did, so I couldn't change, change it, that's what happened. But. And, and the rest is truly history, as they like to say, and I think that's what's fantastic about having you all, that mm -hmm. I like to say that reporters have a front row seat to history, and you all certainly have had the well, seat. Well, I want to compliment uh, Bob here. It didn't take him a second to realize somebody had been shot. You know, he just, he's right he's right. <laughs> He wasn't supposed to go on the air, but he stepped in front of the camera. And by the way, you want to tell him why you called him Lee Harold? Yes, yes. You noticed, of course, that I <laughs> will go down in history to my sorrow as the man who called him Lee Harold Oswald. <laughs> uh, I, I had been, uh, as it turned out, the only reporter who had actually gone to see the official police information officer who was Captain Glenn King and that was on Saturday following the assassination and Glenn was not necessarily happy to have me around and I uh, I went ahead and said I need to check these facts with you and I already had my notes Lee Harvey Oswald and so I started I said okay this is uh, Lee Harvey Oswald ex-marine 24 and he said it's Lee Harold and I said, now look, everybody's, everybody else is saying Lee Harvey Oswald. Are you sure? He says, yes. Uh -oh. I said, uh, where did you get that? He said, I got it off the arrest record. So I thought, well, this is the official word. And I was only 27 years old, so I believed it. And, uh, <laughs> he got burned, boy. Haven't we all been there yeah, as reporters? I was determinedly calling him Lee, Lee Harold. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. That's why. Now let's move on to our next clip. This is a rare color home movie that you're going to see here from George Reed. And it shows one of the remote trucks assisting NBC outside. And Fred will tell you a little bit about the relationship he had with the local stations because we're so happy to have uh, Fred Reinstein with us today because he hasn't done a whole lot of these events here in Dallas. And... Uh, we're happy to have him back here from California. And he was coordinating NBC's coverage as director producer. And uh, so let's see, this is a very short little clip. And this was taken the day of the transfer. And you can see what kind of conditions, uh, working conditions Fred had. It's amazing to me to see that because there were so many people there, right? On a Sunday morning to see this transferred. So obviously word spread quickly, Fred. Uh, tell us about how you got here. You were in California and uh, you were about, what, 36 at the time. As we've already heard, you were 27 and, and the detective here was 43. So you're in California and what happens? Tell us, Fred. Well, I had a day off and was in a, one of the least tasteful sport shirts and scuzzy pants and was on my way to a lawyer's office and I heard that President Kennedy had been shot and I got to the lawyer's office and I 
called the office and said, here's my telephone number if you need me. And about five minutes later, they said, you're on the noon plane to Dallas. Got on the noon plane to Dallas, flew here, hadn't been here before. Our affiliate, WBAP, we had two affiliates in those days, and I can't remember the second one. WBAP was in Fort Worth. I went right to Fort Worth and found it was very chilly here. Should have had a coat. Um, in Fort Worth, they I said, where's the mobile unit? It should be at the jail. And they said, sorry, it's broke. So what do you mean it's broke? <laughs> that the engine done blew up. And uh, I said, well, we, we'll, we'll, this is expurgated. We'll organize a, a tow truck to tow it over to in, oh, put it in front of City Hall. We put it in front of City Hall, immediately established a, a link with AT&T, and started televising out of there. At a point in the first day, the door of the WPA BAP mobile unit was open, and uh, this chap in a dark suit sort of eased his way in, and nobody's paying a lot of attention to him, and he said, we were looking up on the third floor, third floor wasn't it? Yeah. Jimmy, yeah. Up on the third floor, and he said, I know all those people. You do? You want to meet them? You bet. I mean, we had a group of Fort Worth engineers and some guy out of California, and we were kind of strangers, and that was Jack Ruby. And Jack Ruby became our link with the, with the third floor, because as Jim said, he wasn't necessarily loved, but everybody knew him, and he knew everybody, and he was able to really facilitate our coverage. Um, <laughs> The irony. <laughs> yeah. Um, quickly moving on on the coverage, um, it was not a total secret to us that he was going to be moved on that morning. Um, and it was not, I believe it was 10 o'clock, wasn't it, sir? Uh, the, the chief said if you'll be here by 10 o'clock, you yeah. won't miss anything. So uh, I figured that we would never get a chance to see this man live, not alive, live again after he was moved from the, Dallas, from the city jail to the county jail. So we went out and procured Channel 11's mobile unit, which was distinguished because it had a videotape machine, two-inch videotape machine. And that was a luxury that no mobile unit had in those days. 1963. And so, yep. So we fed from the city jail to the county jail and because I felt that it would be really exciting to see this man walk in through those doors from the back and that would be the last we'd see of him. And we'd have still pictures from then on. And of course we were all prepared and we did have a camera live and I was able to persuade our leaders in New York to cut to us and they cut to us about 30, 40 seconds before he was shot. And um, we got it live. And, and that's why uh, you all weren't on live, because right. uh, the network hadn't cut over to you. Uh, from what I understand, Roger Mudd was being uh, waxing poetically, and, and the network missed the, uh, the opportunity to broadcast the shooting of Oswald live. But uh, going back here briefly, Bob, before I forget, is when I was mentioning better be lucky than good, is that it sounds like you knew they were going to toss to you in the basement, but you could not hear Nelson Benton, and he couldn't hear you. And he was looking at that picture from a truck outside. You were inside there, weren't planning on being on the air, but you just come on and start talking. Well, well it me, took let me. Let me compliment him there on one thing. You know, he was right for once. It was the last <laughs> time anybody saw him walking. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That is true. And that's I'd rather be lucky than smart. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I was lucky, but uh, we uh, had, CBS uh, was in control of what we were doing. And the folks in New York uh, were running a series of CBS reporters, including Roger Mudd. Uh, and uh, Harry Reasoner was at the anchor desk. We never called them anchors back then, not that heavy. Uh, we uh, uh, were ready uh, to do the thing, but uh, uh, it, 
I don't know why they decided that we were not going to carry it live. Mm -hmm. But well, what we decided we were going to tape it, and uh, so we were all set up to tape it. Nelson was going to narrate, made sense. He could see all the monitors, and I couldn't. But after a while of being thrown bodily uh, and then uh, stepped on and uh, jostled a bit, jostled a heck of a lot in that crowd uh, immediately after the shooting, I finally got back to my feet and uh, managed to, or at least I had said Oswald has been shot before I think it was Dick Swain who threw me bodily <laughs> off to the <laughs> off to the right. Uh, Dick was about this wide, and, uh, uh, and so I uh, had finally decided it's such a mess down here. I know Nelson can't tell what's happening. What's going on? So here we go. All right. And so I started, and it sounded as though he tossed to you. He tossed it to me, but I came in. Right. Not knowing that he had finally done it. On the nose. Okay, so. Well, could just quickly. Go ahead. Bob sounds very disconsolate that <laughs> CBS didn't cut to him. I want to tell you, NBC had a similar mindset. They did not want to cut oh, down indeed. here. Indeed. Well, yeah. I, I heard Tom Pettit hollered, uh, give it to me. <laughs> I want it. Is that the exact uh, quote? I didn't hear that. But Let's see the video. Okay, so that sets up perfectly this clip, the infamous clip that NBC was rolling live. Uh, Tom Pettit was the reporter who was there in the basement. It is the first murder ever shown live on American television and, and as I mentioned had a profound effect on me because you saw all those reporters. And by the way, all those reporters were men as far as you could see, right? I'm told there was one woman, Peggy Simpson of the Associated Press, but I don't think we see her in any of this uh, shots. But the camera operator had to switch, the NBC camera operator who was Homer Venso. He had to switch from a wide angle lens to a close up manually because they didn't have the kind of camera that Fred wanted there. In fact, they didn't have as many cameras as Fred wanted. So let's take a look at this iconic uh, clip that everyone in this room knows. Captain Fritz, there is the president. There is Leon. Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Detectives have their guns drawn. Oswald has been shot. There is no question about it. Oswald has been shot. Pandemonium has broken loose here in the uh, basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Is... Now, whether the bullet literally hit Oswald or not, we are not absolutely positive. But there has been a gunshot. So there you go. That, uh, you know, seeing this just makes my heart beat very fast because I know what must have been going through you all hearts and minds and having to relive this again today as well. But uh, so Fred, as I mentioned, you were in charge of the coverage here and you ha of course had just about everybody had a camera at the county courthouse waiting for the transfer of Oswald, which I understand was where WFAA was that day and they were not in the basement as far as I know and uh, at least not with a camera rolling. And uh, so you were coordinating all this with out-of-town crew. Tell us a little bit about how you decided to place your cameras and your personnel and this, you, you see the camera just turned the zoom, uh, the lens change right at the moment. It's fantastic. Another fortuitous moment. Well, and, and I, in fairness, the CBS's coverage really ended up being better than ours, but we had a second camera that we were going to move with the prisoner, actually moved after the fact, and it had a zoom lens, and in those days, all television mobile units had three cameras. One had a zoom R, and the zoom R was, had a stick you moved in and out and that sort of stuff and that was very flexible very good and that was going to be my key camera and they 
miraculously, Jim, I don't know what you all did. You shut the door, wouldn't let him go, and so I only had one camera, but I didn't realize it until we were underway because what we had done, as Gloria says, we really thought that the sight of him walking into the county jail was going to be epical, and, and so we got the second unit, Channel 11's mobile unit, as I say, and we stationed that over in front of the jail, and uh, I was sitting in that one. Fortunately, the WBAP unit was feeding to us because it was the la we were going to be the end of it. But the miracle for us was we had a tape machine. Now, tape machines weren't in trucks in those days, and NBC in their sort of very discombobulated mode, they couldn't find the tape of the shooting. So interestingly enough, we ended up replaying the shooting time after time after time from that lovely Channel 11 tape machine. Yeah. All right, so now we're moving on to our final panelists here. And of course, everyone is familiar with the famous photograph uh, taken by our panel member, Dallas Times Herald photographer at the time, Bob Jackson. And uh, he won a Pulitzer for his photograph. But you may not be as familiar with uh, Gary DeLon, who I have known since I was in college. He was on television in San Antonio for many years, and he, I didn't have any idea of your link with this historic story here, Gary. So it's been a real pleasure to get back with you and reminisce a little bit about San Marcos and San Antonio. And he, Bob here taught there as well. But anyway, so this, what we're going to see in this clip, is the Gary, as we like to say, getting debriefed as he rushes back to the newsroom, which is, I was told, uh, about eight tenths of a mile after he has witnessed uh, the shooting of Lee Harvey Oswald by Jack Ruby, and then directly following that, uh, and it's he's voicing under. Bob's great photographs, and then directly after that is, you're not going to see anything on the screen, you're going to hear basically the narration of Gary down in the basement as the shooting occurs, that of course he was going to take back to the station, and he did, uh, post haste. So let's take a look at these two. First a, a, a visual clip and one just an audio clip. This is Bob Jackson's photographs and Gary DeLon. Gary DeLon, who was on the scene at the moment, has come rushing in. He can't even talk now. Obviously coming. What, what, what happened, Gary? Go ahead. As uh, Oswald was being uh, escorted to an armored truck, which was about 100 feet from the scene. Suddenly, a shot rang out from right above our heads, and about this time, Oswald grabbed his stomach and fell to the floor, and someone said, oh no, and I don't know who said it, and there was a mad scramble, and a bunch of police officers made a dash for one group of men and grabbed someone. And about this time, it was cordoned up. And then uh, Oswald was dragged back into the ante room off the, off the checkout desk at the Dallas City Jail in the basement. That's uh, your report. Then Gary DeLong was on the scene at the time. Did you, Gary, did you get a chance to see the man? Did you see the man who... I know who the man was that shot you know Harvey Oswald. I think everybody does over there. Uh, I don't think his name has been released, but he is a well-known Dallasite who reportedly owns a, a Dallas nightclub. He has been taken into custody, and uh, we don't know yet if this is the man or not. We are waiting to see. However, they do have this name uh, from this came in. He reportedly came in with a TV cameraman, and the shot rang out from where the cameras were were pointed toward the exit from which Oswald would would come. How many shots were there? Jerry? One shot only. Just one. Yes, one shot, and everybody started falling to the floor, and I was knocked to the ground in the mad scramble. Well, it was pandemonium and confusion. And here he comes, Lee Oswald, the accused assassin, Captain Wilfred's leading the way. 
being escorted by police officers and the sheriff. The shot rang out. The shot has rung out. And Lee Oswald falls. Lee Oswald has fallen. A shot has rung out here. A struggle is being in place. A shot has rung out. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lee Oswald, Lee Oswald has just been shot. A shot has rung out. Uh, the, the press is being gathered now. Uh, and everyone says, everyone says, nobody out. Oswald fell. So that was uh, recorded as Oswald was shot. You had it on your tape recorder and you ran back to the station. So that's why you were out of breath. Tell us a little bit about I that. I wasn't a mile runner for the Olympics, that's for sure. <laughs> but just let me say real quickly, I, I really feel honored and humbled that I was asked to come up here. These guys are tremendous. Uh, and when Gary and and Stephen asked me several months to go to come up. I said I'd be glad to, but had I known that it was going to interfere with the Aggie Alabama kickoff, <laughs> <laughs> so you hightailed it, and that thing was bulky, right? Well, I don't, the recorder I don't know. It was not no tiny little uh, thing. Well, it was. Let me say this: Gordon McClendon was a great broadcaster, one of my heroes. But as a uh, station owner, he was the most frugal man I'd ever known. <laughs> And he did not buy us a Telefunken or the real high quality uh, recorders, a little reel-to-reel -reel recorder, and it was in a, a case, you know. And uh, so the quality wasn't what it would have been today. And don't forget, we didn't have any live satellite feeds in those days. Television was the only medium going live. And so I had to get that back. And the ironic part about that is that the station manager heard it, and he said the quality was so bad, he told the DJ, whomever it was that day, Ferris Bookstool knows all that, but he said, don't play that anymore. It's bad quality. Well, Gordon called and said, play that over and over like it's live. <laughs> so wow. that's what happened. And the, the ironic part of that story is that I'd been up so many hours, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, the news director said, don't bother to go down there Sunday morning. It's, you know, it's going to be a routine, routine transfer. Routine, yeah. Well, I woke up and I'd just been married four months and my wife at that time thought she was going to divorce me, I think, but she said, I woke up at 1.30 and she said, where are you going? I said, I've got to go. She said, why? I said, I've been on this from the start and I've got to finish it. And so I went down there and had I not been there that day as a volunteer <laughs> on my own time, KLIF would not have had that. So uh, I felt, I felt highly compensated even though I was, it didn't show up in my paycheck. Right. Right. <laughs> Not at all. All right. Well, Bob, everybody knows your pictures and we see you in these clips that you're the one down low getting, yeah, as yeah. they call the money Standing shot. in front of the camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which they told you to sit down, yeah. but tell us a little bit more. Uh, how long did it before, how did you come to work that day, at, but how long before you realized that you had the picture. Well, uh, after the shooting, uh, of course, we didn't have cell phones then, so I had to get to a phone and call the paper, and, and I called my chief photographer, and uh, and he said, "Did you get something good?" I said, "Well, <laughs> I hope so." Um, he said, "Well, UPI is uh, frantic; they want your film, and they." are willing to send a runner over to get it. And I said, no way would I give my film to a runner. I said, and my words were, he might get hit by a bus on the way back. And so I said, no, I'll wait here. The paper wanted to send another photographer from the paper over to relieve me. So I had to wait there, and it was almost 2 o'clock. Of course, the shooting was 11.21 or so. Mm -hmm. um, so it was almost two o'clock before I got back to the paper and ran my film. And of course everybody was anxious to know what I got because Jack Beer's picture, which was shot a fraction of a second before mine, was already on the wire machine. Everybody was looking at it and they said, do you have anything as good as this? And I said, I'll let you know when I run my film. 
And so uh, I went and ran my film, and I remember looking at the wet film, you know, up to the light, and it looked good, and I, I let out a yell. <laughs> and uh, then our chief photographer and I went and made a wet print real quick and carried it out to the newsroom. And then we realized we had beat the Dallas News, which was our number one goal in those days. You know. Some things never change. Right. And it, the competition in this business. That's right. So uh, right now I'd ask you to hold up your cards and quietly so someone can come pass them down. You want them down this way? And I'm going to continue asking questions, but this way we've already got your cards and they can go through them. Gloria, could, could I go ahead, Fred? Interject one thing because we've all just heard this. I'm not a reporter. I'm, I, I used Producer. to have to deal with them. But, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Fred. <laughs> but think about the tone of these three articulate reporters you've heard. People who made their living commenting on things, being prescient, being wise, being reflective. They're so totally surprised in this atmosphere. Uh, Tom Pettit was one of the more lucid reporters I ever worked with. All he said was, he's been shot. He's been shot. He's been shot. He's been shot. Right. The, the, the whole sense of shock and surprise is, is part of the ambience that's awfully hard to convey. Right. That's the name of the program. Oswald has been shocked. And so uh, we continue now. Uh, this is, as we've mentioned, you all are kind of reminiscing amongst yourselves today, and that's been wonderful to watch. It's interesting to note that Fred comes in out of town and immediately meets Jack Ruby. But he was known to all of you all. So do you want to share, Fred, go ahead and share your story. You've got to tell him about uh, Chicken Delight, will you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, again, I ask you to remember that, I don't know, here we are, a bunch of engineers from Fort Worth, which is, I gather, in the same state, and, <laughs> and L.A., which is certainly not, and we don't know anybody, and to find this, this resource was something well, Ruby was not above enjoying his celebrity and that sort of stuff, and he felt he had he could occupy the producer's seat, and um, he did, and in the evening, we stayed there a long time. We sent out to get some chicken delight dinners, and of course, we were a little parsimonious, so we had one for everybody, and he'd been there, and he left, and suddenly we were missing a chicken delight dinner, and <laughs> some, some gun got our dinner. Walked off with the chicken dinner there. Now, reading your oral histories, and if you haven't done that, please do. The, the stories are tremendous. And uh, Gary, you mentioned that you weren't really, you knew uh, Jack Ruby, of Jack Ruby, and you mentioned he was a little man trying to be a big man. Uh, tell us a little bit about him being like a hanger-on. He was a wannabe. Obviously, he meets Fred right away. First off, they, they admitted their age. Bob said he was 27 at the time, and JR was 43. I was 18 at the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, 30, I think. Uh, well, first off, uh, give me a little background scenario. Uh, and Ferris Rooks will help me with the research on this because I, I forget names sometimes. But uh, I lived in a beautiful apartment over on Live Oak. And uh, around the pool every day, I'd see this gorgeous, gorgeous girl. And uh, she asked me my name, and I asked her. She knew I was at KLIF. And, and uh, her name was Penny Dollar. That was stage name. Penny Dollar. Penny Dollar. And she could give you a lot of change. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Jack gave me a, uh, he gave me a card with his name on it. He said, come down anytime. Come down, come down. Well. To the carousel to club. To the carousel club. Well, of course, I wouldn't admit that I ever went. I never did go. I mean, <laughs> but. Uh, he was a hanger-on, and he was a wannabe, as, as she says, and, and uh, he would, a groupie. You're familiar with the golf groupies and all that? Well, he would always hang around KLIF, and he bothered everybody to death a lot of times. And So when this happened, when the assassination of JFK happened, he was down there in no time at all. And uh, he would answer phones, KLIF, Jack Ruby. And, 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 <laughs> and so he was helping to report the, the assassination. So they wanted to get rid of the guy. He was, and what can I do? What can I do? Well, Ken Dower, somebody, I don't know who it was, said he had a lot of sandwiches that he had bought. 
<laughs> and so he said, yeah, I'll take him to Gary Don. Yeah, yeah, I'll go over there. You were at the PD. I was at the police department. Had been there a long time. And they said, well, Gary's been over there. He hadn't had anything to drink or eat. And he said, okay. So Ferris again told me exactly what I never knew. I wrote an article years ago called, what kind of sandwich was it that Jack brought me in? Was supposed to bring you? It was, it was corned beef which I hated anyway, but he brought those to the police department in a sack and he kept asking around in the lineup room where they'd taken Oswald. Uh, this was when you saw the famous shot like this, the Marxist sign of revolution. And, and uh, he had the black eye where he'd been arrested at the Texas theater, but uh, he kept saying, where's Gary, anybody seen Gary Delon? Anybody? Well, by that time, Oswald. And so this is when his little insignificant mind, as he wanted to be a martyr and want to be and star, he saw this guy up there that had uh, been accused of killing President Kennedy. He said, I'm going to get that SOB. And, and uh, he wanted to avenge. And that's what he told Pat Dean and some other officers. He wanted to avenge Jackie Kennedy. And uh, that's, that's uh, how, and then no one knew this until months later during the Jack Ruby appeal when Phil Burleson was one of the attorneys. And he asked me to bring a tape that I'd made with Jack when he was race, racing to the, they are taking him to the courtroom. And as I stand up to testify, he says, yells across the room, says, Gary, where were you that night? I was looking for you. And, and so that's the first time that anybody had known that he was looking for me at the PD that night. Wow. And Jim? Let, talk, let talk me about tell Jack you Ruby. about them sandwiches. Yes? <laughs> Did the cops wind up with them? <laughs> no, they brought them to us. And uh, somebody up there thought they were doing a good deal, and they, re go, they refused them. So they took him over to there to, to him. That's how he got the sandwich. I didn't uh, get one. No sandwich for Jim. Yes. I didn't get one. No. Was, but was Jack Ruby a, a police groupie? Did he hang oh, out yeah, at PD? Yeah, he wanted to be. Uh, there's something that I might inject here that might be of little interest. Uh, I transferred Jack Ruby the next day, uh, but I didn't handcuff myself to him. <laughs> <laughs> And I, neither did I tell the media I was going to go take him either. That's right. So uh, uh, when bringing him down, he wanted to wear my hat, my coat, and everything. He was afraid somebody was going to shoot him. And uh, so I told him, I said, well, you don't have anything to worry about. You're not worth killing anyhow. So, uh, uh, but I asked him uh, why he shot Oswald. And he said, well, I just want to be a hero. And he says, looks like I've messed things up good. And I said, well, you can certainly say that again. But the backside of that is, I happen to think about 13 years earlier, he had a Western dance hall down on South Irvy. And I was in uniform at the time. And we used to go into those joints like that around uh, 10 o'clock, 10.30. And uh, if there's anybody in there, Looks like they was getting a little too much to drink and so forth. Uh, uh, we'd walk through the crowd and touch them on, on the shoulder and say, Partner, don't you think you've had enough to drink? And they'd look up and say, Yeah, officer, I think you're right. I believe I'll go home. And they'd get up and leave, and we didn't have the fights, fighting, the shootings, and stabbings then when they closed at midnight, which they had to then, right. as they do today. And uh, But the way we worked that, was the two of us went in, and one of us would stand there at the end of the counter and talk to Jack, because he would sit at the end of the counter running the cash register. He sat on a high stool, and he had two 45s on his side. <laughs> and uh, uh, then the, my other, my partner would circle a crowd. And if he run into any trouble, he'd just hold his hand up, and I'd go to him. Or if it's the other way around, he was that. there. But one time while I was standing there talking to Jack, he made this statement. And I didn't think about it when he told me that he wanted to be a hero when I transferred him until a few days later. But, what, uh, but he told me while I was standing there talking to him, he said, you know, I always want to see two police officers in a death struggle with a fight, and I could jump in there and save them and be a hero. And so then it dawned on me what he had told me 13 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And it fit together. That's right. exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a hero. Wow. He wanted to be somebody. Let me just add this. Uh, <clears throat> there was a different side that everybody knew Jack was kind of a, you know, kind of a sleazy guy. Yeah. And he'd been uh, run out of Chicago, so the story was, because he was in a punch board operation in Chicago and supposedly somebody in the mob didn't like him. But anyway, my wife was uh, 24 years old. She was the emergency supervisor at St. Paul Hospital. And uh, 
Jack often, especially after a late night, uh, like Saturday night or whatever, after the club had closed, he'd bring his girls in uh, for the necessary uh, inoculations or whatever. And uh, he said one night, one came in, beautiful girl, said she'd been hit in the mouth with a beer bottle or something, so they had to stitch her up. And uh, she said Jack, though, was always so concerned about his girls, very nice, said, he'd, Mr. Taylor, can I, can I be a... So one night he brought in his bouncer, he accompanied the uh, O'Neill ambulance, I think, and uh, he'd been stabbed in the stomach with a bed spring. I don't ask me how, I don't know. But he was... He was a, a bed spring. bed spring. And anyway, he was bleeding profusely, and so she had to cut the clothes off of him, and, and she had no help because it was loaded that night. And so uh, she said, Ruby, Ruby, get in here. And he'd been out pacing the floor because he was so concerned. And he said, yes, ma'am, what can I do? And so he had to help her cut off those clothes. And she said he was always a very good gentleman, very courteous, always said, Miss Taylor. And so that was a different side of Jack Ruby that everybody knew, even though there was, you know, maybe that little glimmer right. of light. B Bob Jackson, how did this event change your life, your career? Well, it didn't change my life so much. Uh, it didn't make it easier to get a job if I wanted to, like I did leave the Times Herald and I went to the Denver Post and I didn't have to show them a big portfolio, <laughs> portfolio. or anything. You know. <laughs> so I, I didn't have any trouble getting a job, but you know, in that sense, uh, it helped, it uh, gave me credibility. Uh, it also put the pressure on to in future assignments, uh, no matter how small and ridiculous some of them were, you still, you know, felt like you should do the best job you possibly can because you have some sort of reputation to live up to, you know. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not really much different. Uh, I might, if I, if we have time, I might mention this. Yes. Uh, on that day, my assignment was to shoot the prisoner transfer and then go out to Parkland Hospital and photograph the press conference that Governor Connolly's wife was having. <clears throat> and while we were there at the police station down in the basement, we realized, the reporter and I realized that we weren't going to be able to make both of those assignments uh, because they weren't bringing Oswald down when they said they were. So he went and called uh, the newspaper, talked to the guy on the city desk, who I, I won't mention his name, uh, <laughs> and he said, well, you go back and tell Jackson that uh, to blow this off, if, if he doesn't have time to get the picture, if they don't bring Oswald down, you've got to get to that press conference because it's important. <laughs> and so he came back and told me that, and I, and I said, there's no way I'm going to leave here. And I knew my boss would back me up on this. And so I, I said, you go back in there and tell him we're not going to leave. They're going to have to find, send some other photographer. So he did that, and, and he came back and said, well, they told him that you guys are off the hook because we're going to send Willie Allen, who just happened to drop Walk in into the, the paper. So. Uh, just think, if I had listened and to left, and I would not have gotten the shot, and I wouldn't have made Lavelle so famous. <laughs> <laughs> while, while we're on here, let, let's try to keep our answers a little shorter because the, now we've got questions from our audience okay. here. And right on, Bob, while you're talking about this photograph, obviously, uh, two real quick questions. How do you feel about its place in pop culture from one of our audience members? And how is the negative being protected today? Two good questions, I think. First, what was the first one? Number one, how do you feel about your photograph being part of pop culture? And uh, number two. I have mixed feelings there. Okay, tell uh, us. The negative's in a safe deposit box in Colorado Springs. Okay. You have mixed feelings. Yeah. Why? Well, I don't know. I think this many years later, it's it's not so bad. But at the time. But, you know, right soon afterwards, when somebody came and wanted to put the image on T-shirts, I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. no way, you know. And that was within a few short years after the assassination. Wow. But uh, anyway. Wow, I, I had not known that, Bob. Uh, 
you all mentioned this briefly. You all knew that he was going to be uh, transferred. So how concerned were you that something like this was going to happen? I, I'm struck by the comments in your oral histories. In all honesty, we were concerned. Um, uh, the first day that I had spent at, uh, I had been at Parkland Hospital on the Friday until the hearse left, but I, my assignment the next day and from then on was was the police beat because that was usually mine anyway. And uh, I, so I was assigned to go down there and uh, um, what was that question again? Uh, well, you all kind of feared this would well, happen, right? Yes, as a matter, I started to mention, as a matter of fact, that uh, the Saturday before uh, Oswald was shot, uh, Nelson Benton and I, he was our CB, he was the CBS correspondent, I was the local KRLD guy, so I pretty much deferred to Nelson. We were sitting on the third floor, on the floor with our backs up against the wall, watching those elevator doors open up and people disgorge from the uh, elevator and I said uh, you know nobody's checking IDs uh, right now what if somebody just uh, stepped out of one of those elevators and started raking us with a Tommy gun and we looked at each other and uh, without another word we got up and moved <laughs> And uh, from that time on, we were keenly aware, because of all of the crank crazy calls that Jim has mentioned, and the same kind of thing was going on at the switchboard of every uh, media outlet in town. Uh, we were aware that we were at the epicenter of a really dangerous situation. No, I, I, I really think that it, it, it enhanced the whole live coverage. I think people... people Saw the that, value in it, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, yes, I really do. I think that it was such a shock and it was such a revelation that, you know, that much more live coverage. Right, and television news, I think, in my humble opinion, came of age at this moment, this four days of history that unraveled in front of our eyes. Jim, uh, Daniel wants to know, do you know or have you seen evidence that Oswald uh, and Ruby knew each other? I can't count how many hours or weeks or months that I spent trying to make a connection on that and I was never able to make any connection whatsoever and Ruby denied it all the time and uh, of course he took a polygraph test and that was one of the questions that was asked about that and he uh, passed it uh, according to the examiner I didn't see the t I haven't see the test but so I, after many hours of work on it, I am convinced that, he, that they did not know each other. Well, the first place is uh, Ruby run a club, a, a strip club. And if uh, Oswald had any redeeming qualities at all, <laughs> he didn't drink and he didn't hang around clubs. So the two just didn't match. Interesting, interesting. This, I guess, to all of you all, briefly, and, and we'll start our way this way. Bob Jackson, could something like this happen again? Could something like this happen? I think so. Um, of course, now, they would move him in secret. <laughs> I mean, but it could happen, depending on the situation and the circumstances. But we don't have access, uh, the, pre the media, I mean the photographers, they don't have the access that we had then to a lot of these type of events. I mean, they would never, this scenario would never, never happen again. Gary? Captain Fritz told me one time, we talked about this very subject, and he said, any time that a person is intent enough to kill somebody, you can't stop him, sooner or later, it can happen, and it could any time today, as we've seen many times in the news. I just want to say two quick things. There are two photographs that are probably the most memorable of any event in history. One is the Joe Rosenthal, Iwo Jima picture, 
and the other is Bob Jackson's shooting of Oswald. And, and this is a little inside thing that he may not want me to mention, but I'm going to do it anyway. J.R. Lavelle has made probably 2,500 appearances, interviews, whatever, since 1963. The man has never asked for any money at any one time. Today, he could be a millionaire if he had taken advantage of that. And I want to say thank you, Jim. Uh -huh. Hand it over, Gary. Fred, could this happen again? Sure. You bet. And I mean, I think particularly in, in the kind of an environment we're now living in where people kill each other in random ways and, and instead of the coverage causing it to be suppressed, people are encouraged to do it. Look at, look at, the, look at the television, look at the newspapers. Yes, I fear it could happen again. Bob Huffaker. Yes, I am of, of the same mind. I'm afraid that uh, you can't set up an absolute security perimeter around everything. But certainly since those days, uh, there has been a great deal of advance in uh, metal, techno metal detecting technologies and things like that. Right. And also a great increase in uh, security in normal everyday offices like television stations mm -hmm. and newspapers. Yeah, there, well. Yes. Well, sometimes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can't even go up into the Antares, what it used to be, the, the ball, the Reunion Tower ball, without going through security now. And at the county courthouse, they took away my comb oh. uh, So when I went for jury duty. So uh, moving on to some of our questions here, and uh, they are really some you good questions. Yeah, well, you said yes, but go ahead, answer. You want well, to expand def def on that? Definitely, uh, it can happen again, but what they won't do is pull the stunt that we did because they learn everybody learn from that they won't have a public display uh but yes it can it can happen and uh did the chief take a lot of heat for that afterwards oh, I, I and he know. was kind of know. coerced into doing it he didn't want to do it well, either according to you i don't know but i'd you like to he's, talk, he um, was pressured and he was definitely pressured oh yeah uh, yeah of course, my friend down there on the end, he told me he several times, he said, look, I've made a hero out of you. And he all thought about publicity. And I said, yes, and I made a millionaire out of you. And I'll trade places with you. It trade places. No trade, all right. No truth to that. All right. Now, uh, this one's for you too, Jim. Now, I, I understand your hat, which was a resist all. Yeah. And your suit, yeah. which was not white, it was? Tan color. Right, they're both here in the museum and I think they're gonna go on display next year for the 50th. The handcuffs. Is with the suit. Also with them. So Brian wants to know, was it difficult releasing the handcuffs and did Ruby resist letting go of the gun? You saw the gun before he shot Oswald. Yes, I saw it uh, when I first, when I stepped out. The camera lights come on and momentarily blinded me but I was looking down and he had his had that gun in his hand and holding it by his side and I that is when I made my first move because I realized then that he was about to shoot also and I tried to jerk him behind me but when I since he was right close to me I couldn't move him much if he'd have been at arm's length I could have jerked him plumb off his feet but uh, he's right close to me so when I jerked back on him to pull him behind me I, all I did was turn his body so that the, instead of the bullet hitting him dead center, it hit to the left of the navel. And uh, of course it went all the way through and lodged over here. It actually hit the end of the seventh rib and glanced off and lodged just under the skin here. And when I checked him, I could roll that bullet around underneath the skin just like that. And uh, so when I got him to Parkland Hospital, I went into the operating room with him and I told the doctors, I said, before you do anything else, I want that bullet out of him. And so he pinched it up and hit it with a scalpel. It popped out into a tray that a nurse was holding. Wow. I immediately took my trusty pocket knife out that had a sharp point on it, and I told the nurse, I said, I want you to scratch your initial on the butt end of this while I watch it, because you and I will be testifying in court that this is a bullet to come out of it. Wow. 
Yeah. And we did uh, several times. I did mm -hmm. on hearings. But uh, it, it's just one of those things that you can't help sometimes. That's good detective work there. So why was there an ambulance already at the police station? I wondered that too when I saw it. They were just kind of signaling it in because the truck was still up there, the armored we, truck. We were fortunate in a way O'Neill's ambulance had been on a call and are headed back to their office and they was uh, they picked up the call on their radio and they was only a few blocks away and they radioed in and said they'd take the call. <laughs> And so they were there in just a matter of a few minutes. Somebody wanted to ask the question earlier, how much time elapsed between That's what the I time. asked you. From the time he was shot to the time uh, he was loaded in the ambulance, how I much would time say, went by? I um, estimate it wasn't more than 10 to 12 minutes at the most from, that, from the time he was shot until we loaded him on the ambulance. Took me that long to run to the station. <laughs> right, because you ran yeah, almost a tell, mile. We, we could tell that too. <laughs> Well, we asked Bob this, Bob Jackson, earlier. How did this event change your life, Gary? We've heard Bob talk about it a little bit. Uh, made well, him rich. <laughs> made Bob. I think He's I not going to let you live that down, Bob Jackson. <laughs> I think I got a raise from 118 to 128 a week. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it also taught me that I ought to need a, a good quality recorder whenever I go out on the scene. <laughs> but... As I, we were talking about this earlier, and it, the only way it changed it was the fact that, I mean, I was a wet behind the ears newsman in those days. I, I mean, I'd been in business a few years, but nothing ever like that. And to think that uh, I was able to cover it, and uh, hopefully proficiently, it gave me confidence for my career. And I, I never doubted my career after that. Fred, how did this change your life? Well, I, I, I probably saved my job. <laughs> I, the, my boss didn't like me much, and I think he was going to fire me in. <laughs> he was forced to keep me. And, and you really pushed for the, for the coverage there. You said they oh, didn't yeah, want to go live. Oh, yeah. So there, there was a, 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 the president of the network was sitting next to my boss in New York, and he said, we're going to stay there. We're about to go into the rotunda, and we're not going to cut here. And I made some aspersions about my boss's manhood and whatever and, um, he did. I, I just want to say one thing, you know, I, here I was from out of town and here we are 49 years later. Jim, I'm awfully sorry I didn't get to meet you then. It, it, I'd have felt different. I wish you'd been directing for CBS too. <laughs> That's a good one. Bob, how's this changed your life? You well, had quite a varied life, too. <laughs> he was teaching in San Marcos, too, and, you know, television newsman. Well, yeah. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was... Um, Your career. My career, uh, such yeah. as it was, uh, was varied. I ended up... Uh, this assassination finally uh, drove me to want to do something more productive in life. So I decided I'd become a teacher. And I went up to uh, the University of North Texas, uh, met my glorious wife, Viva, and uh, also got a master's and a PhD and taught English for the next uh, uh, couple of decades and never ever blew my cover. I never let them know that I had been a news person. That you were in front row to history. And I would have never been able to explain an independent clause to my students if I had <laughs> ever let them know. So I was teaching English and uh, I felt it was uh, a little bit more productive thing to do. For most newsmen, if they said PhD, they'd say piled higher and deeper. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, most people who insist on being called doctor probably should be called something else. <laughs> J Jim LaBelle, how has this changed your life? Well, uh, you were already a veteran police officer when this happened and did some good police work. I tried not to let anything that happened in my police work interfere with my personal life and uh, I it was the incident was never mentioned around the house uh, unless someone else brought it up. 
But uh, if you had asked me a month or two after the assassination how long that was, this would remain in the news, I'd have said, give it three or four months and you won't hear anything else about it. <laughs> wow. But here it is, 49 years, and I still get roughly uh, 300 requests for autographs a year. I average about three a week. That's more than so, me. So, uh, <laughs> well, you don't deserve that much. <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh boy, I'm telling you, we're finding out. Okay, so everybody in up, up here except for Fred was here in Dallas when the president was shot, right? Is it? That's right. Something. Yes. Anybody go ahead. Anybody runs into my wife, please don't mention Penny Dollar. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> Just between us friends. He didn't know Penny Dollar. <laughs> All right, your single most, starting with Bob Jackson, what's your single most vivid memory of 11-22-1963? What has stayed with you decades later? Of oh, 11 -22. Yes, the actual day of the president's yeah. assassination. Seeing the rifle in the window on the ledge and with an empty camera in my hand that I had just unloaded. <laughs> Now you were working That's the, the most crowds, vivid right? Memory, yeah. You were working the crowds, camera. taking pictures for the paper, and you just ran out of film, and you look up. Uh, yeah, I'm sitting on the back of a convertible up on. You were in the motorcade. In the motorcade, in the eighth car, and I had already been told, uh, unload your camera and put your film in an envelope, and Jim Featherston's going to be standing on the corner of Main and Houston, and when you see him, give him the film. And it's just, it was just pictures from Love Field through town in the motorcade. So I did that. As we turned the corner, I saw him and I threw it out. And uh, the wind being gusty that day, and Featherston was a, was a little chubby, and he had to chase it. The wind caught it and he had to chase it. We were laughing, and that's when we heard the first shot. And the car, we had made the turn and we're facing the book depository and, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to load the camera real quick but not really feeling like I should be in a hurry and we heard the first shot and then a pause and then two more shots closer <laughs> together and I just looked up where the sound came from and there was the rifle on the on the ledge and I could see him draw it in wow. and that was my most, most <laughs> vivid memory of that day. Gary. 1122 because you said you worked the whole weekend nonstop. That was of the president was here on Friday and well first off you, you don't think that you're going to be involved in anything that that magnifi Big. magnitude and and, uh, and as I said I was an experienced newsman and and when that phone rang that day uh, you just react automatically. <coughs> Pardon me. The rule was you you turn on your tape recorder and you say who is this. And I didn't do that. And then only till the last few months, Mr. Rookstool has found out who that was, and he told me who it was. <laughs> so Pardon someone me. called the station to tell you that yeah, the president there's, there's had another been newsman shot. from Houston, and I immediately followed up. <coughs> Pardon me. Oh boy. And uh, I confirmed it with the police department, and we went on the air. And uh, Ferris told me that the FBI was listening to KLIF that day, and. Our broadcast was the first of the shots being fired on local radio. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, memorable. the rest is history. Yes. <laughs> As they say. Fred, where were you? What were you doing? November 22nd, 1960. I was driving to, on my day off, to the lawyer's office, and I was listening on the radio, and uh, I heard the president shot. I got to the lawyer's <laughs> office. I called the office, and we didn't have cell phones. Right. <laughs> called the office, said, I'm, I'm here. Call me if you need me. And they called in about 10 minutes and said, Bubba, you're on the noon plane to Dallas. So I got a rental car. What will I do with it? I just leave it in front of American Airlines. And I said, send me the book on the affiliate and I'll get on the plane. I did. And that's why you didn't have a coat. You didn't have the gear. It was cold, right? I didn't have socks. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> California boy yeah, here. Yeah. Bob, how about your... What? It, most uh, vis uh, vivid memory <laughs> from November 22nd, 1963. I was uh, reporting, uh, I was broadcasting the motorcade live from Maine and Ackard. Our, uh, uh, my two colleagues, Wes Wise and Frank Gleber, had been broadcasting the motorcade 
from Love Field and then Lemon Avenue. Then I was the last uh, live guy on the, uh, uh, on the route. motorcade route. Mm -hmm. And that uh, beautiful sight of the couple, they were absolutely gorgeous people, the president and his wife. And Dallas had had some uh, chancy things happen around here. The uh, incident with the United Nations Ambassador Adlai Stevenson a month before, uh, an another incident uh, uh, where uh, people were spitting on uh, LBJ and his wife as they made it across from the Baker to the Adolphus. And uh, so we were we were especially concerned that Dallas not get any more black marks. We were just hoping that things would go well. And never did we, of course, dream anything so horrible. But I remember when the limo passed and the cheers went up and the confetti flew down from the windows above, I thought, Dallas is showing the president that they care. And then, in no time, I was at Parkland Hospital, having had to get the wagon up. Well, the mobile you, unit? The police officers had, had uh, cordoned that place off. I had a press pass this big on the windshield, and hoping that they would not uh, shoot me, I jumped the car over the curb and all the way across medians to back near the ER, yeah. and that's where I'd been on that day. Uh, I left Parkland with my colleague Warren Folks, who was sharing the broadcast out there with me. Um, and uh, it was as though a beautiful day had just become the worst nightmare I'd ever had, and it was not ending. Jim Lavelle, you get the last word today. Thank you so much for your questions out there. Wish we could get to more, but I think we've heard a lot today. You, you get the last word. What, what do you remember of that day? What will stay well, with you forever? Uh, first off, I'm gonna, I've am been ribbing my friend over there. He's a great photographer, and he has other pictures besides this that you ought to see sometime, and they did have a showing of them here at this museum at one time. And uh, uh, if you could just see some of the other works that he's done, you realize what a great photographer he really is. All right, back to that particular day. 11-22-1963. Uh, yeah, I remember it. So, uh, <laughs> the, uh, all of the officers in my, in my bureau were given assignments that day. And we had two of them riding in the motorcade. But my partner was on vacation, so Captain Fritz told me, he said, why don't you just stick around the office and take care of anything that comes in? So I said, uh, well, of course, I always agree with the captain when he tells me something, so <laughs> I stayed, stayed there. But they, had a, they sent Charlie Brown, a patrolman, up there to work with me. And I uh, had an information of where an armed robbery suspect was holed up. And I told Charlie, I said, let's go see if my information is any good. About 99 times it's not. So, but we went and hit pay dirt. So we arrested him and come back in. And on the way back in, we was listening to the radio and the dispatcher was given the location of the motorcade, uh, where, uh, right along where it was. And when we pulled into the basement where Oswald was later shot, uh, the motorcade was approached in Houston Street. And uh, so the assassination of the president happened after we turned the motor off and started walking through the basement, caught the elevator to the third floor. When I walked in the third floor uh, office, uh, Lieutenant Wells told me, he said, well, they shot the president. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know they did, because I had just been listening to it. And, and I thought he's pulling my leg, but they, he had the uh, squawk box on, as we call it, from the dispatcher's office, and it didn't take but just a second or two to figure out he was telling the truth. So he told me, he said, uh, 
you put that prisoner up and get down there and find out what's going on and call me. Because back those days, we didn't have the walkie-talkies and the cell phones and all of this kind of stuff that people now, I see these officers go out of, walk out of here and they got phones and wires running every, out of every office of the body. <laughs> so, it's, uh, and uh, the, uh, we didn't have that kind of stuff. And uh, so if I was out in the field and had to call my office, I had to find a pay phone and call in. Uh, so, so Charlie and I got in the car and headed down there. We couldn't get all the way down to this sixth floor because the officers had blocked Elm off. And we liked about a block and a half or so getting here. And we got out and walked the rest of the way down to this building. And when we got here, uh, there's an inspector of police on the front steps. And I asked him, I said, have you got the building covered off front and back so nobody can get in and out? He said, yes, it's covered off. And he said, your officers, talking about the homicide officers, said, they're upstairs searching now. Uh, but he said, there's a lot of people that come over here and told me they saw this or that and the other. But he said, I didn't know what to do with them, so I sent them over to the sheriff's office. Well, knowing how witnesses have a habit of changing their stories, uh, uh, later on, I thought, it, and if Captain M was up here searching, they could do a good job without me. Charlie Brown came on up. So I went over to the sheriff's office, and Alan Sweat, the chief deputy over there, he had about 15 or 18 people in this uh, meeting room, and he's wringing his hands like this, and he said, oh, I got all of your witnesses here. What am I going, what do you want me to do with them? So I told Alan, I said, well, I need statements from every one of them, and I don't have anybody right now to take them. Can you call some of your people in to take them? And he said, oh, yeah. So he got on the phone and called his dispatcher, starting to raise up his deputies out there and try to get them in to take statements. But about that time, there were six burglary and theft detectives walked into the room, and they and Red, Ed, the Red Edwards, who was a senior officer in the group. He said, Jim, we were sent down here to help you. What do you need? And I said, you're just exactly what I need. I said, all of these people here saw something or heard something. I said, scatter out that desk and take, and take down what they have to say and uh, have them sign it and put their name, address, and phone number on it. And I said, I'll go run back over to this, over here to this building and check and see what's happening and then I'll come back and give you a hand. Well, as I started out the door, the sheriff's squat box was running on, and he said a Dallas police officer had been shot in Oak Cliff. Well, I picked up the phone sitting right by there, and I called Lieutenant Weld, and I said, who's covering that officer's shooting? And he said, I don't have anybody to cover it. And I said, all right, I'll take it. So I knew my car was was uh, hemmed in, I couldn't get it out. So I asked Red, because he's kind of a boster individual, he, and I said, Where, where's your car? And I knew he'd have one. He said, right in the middle of Houston Street. I said, well, let me have your keys. I got an officer down and I need to go. So I took his keys and he, he said it right. He left it sitting right in the middle of Houston Street. Wow. So I took it and went to the scene of the officer shooting. I talked to some of the, uh, a couple of the witnesses and uh, the crime lab man showed up and asked me what pictures I wanted. I told him, I said, I want shots of all four sides of the car and, and the, some other, other shot there. And I said, you can take anything else that you think might be of interest. And at that time, of course, they were having uh, calls coming in of a suspect here and there and what have you. And so I, uh, also the uh, officer that answered the call on the tippet, he had some empty holes that came out of the 38 revolver, juggling them like dice in his hand. And I, he told me what they had because the two sisters, Davis sisters, lived in the apartment right in front and they saw Oswald empty those shells out of his gun as he ran across the yard in front of them. Well, I, I asked him, I said, how many people's handled these 
these bullets here, these shells. Well, everybody has. I looked at them. I, know. I said, well, I guess that shoots the fingerprints off of them. But I said, we got one salvation. I said, if we ever come up with a pistol, we can have uh, 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 evidence. The, and time. Oh, uh, the teller. The, the center fire, the button. The, Powder? The firing pen. The firing pen mark. That will be in there. Excuse me, I just turned 40 the other day and I'm trying to uh, that, uh, I love that. Yeah. Get, the, get the firing pin deal. And which we did find, I did get to end up with the pistol and we did end up, I did have those uh, firing pin marks checked and they did come pan out to his gun. But. Uh, so the most vivid memory is that you also had to investigate the murder of a Dallas police officer, right. one, of, one of your well, own. Well, his murder was assigned to me because as you, if you enter a call on a shooting, well, you get that, 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 that assigned to you. So he right. was assigned to me. And that made Oswald my prisoner when we brought him in. Oh. And now a lot of people have asked why I was handcuffed to him. Well, he was my prisoner. And uh, that was the reason that I was handcuffed to him. And wow. Wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know we could be here all day because these men are walking history books. We want to thank our panel members again, Bob Jackson, who at the time was working for the Dallas Times-Herald and shot that Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. A veteran newsman, Gary DeLon, who was working for Cliff and still does broadcasting, some high school football, he says. Fred Weinstein, who joined us all the way from California, back to Texas, working for NBC. He is wearing socks today, Jim just pointed out. Bob Huffacker, who is now living in Colorado, right? Uh, no, that's Bob. No, that's Bob Jackson. Bob. You're in Denton. That's right. right. Pardon me. And, and I pronounce it Huffaker. Huffaker. Okay. It, it was my father who decided it his should fault. be. Yeah, yeah that's his right. Fault. Okay, well, my should apologies to your family. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And of course, he's a jewel. Our Jim Lavelle, detective, Dallas PD, who, of course, will live forever in that photograph, as Bob mentioned, made Jim Lavelle famous, not rich, but you have enriched our lives today with your knowledge and for sharing Thank it, you. all of you. Thank you so much.